All right, welcome back to the very uh, high-tech SciTech studios, uh, where today we're going to be talking about uh, concrete, the first of our uh, structural materials. We've seen concrete, uh, talked about it, uh, of course, when we looked at structural elements, uh, talked in particular about slabs and foundations. Uh, today we'll look at it from sort of a, a different direction. We'll look at it as a material, where it comes from, uh, how we uh, make it, but also how we uh, put it into place on site. We'll look at it in two forms, uh, cast in place and then precast. So today's lecture will be split into three parts. In this part, we'll talk about some concrete basics, uh, and then we'll do uh, separate little bites on uh, port in place concrete or in situ concrete, and then precast. We'll talk about the differences both architecturally, uh, structurally, and some of the advantages and disadvantages uh, of using one, uh, one or the other. With all of our material discussions, we'll be looking both at the aspirations, what we want to do, uh, sometimes what performance criteria we want, but also the things that we want out of the material. Uh, and we'll be looking at the restrictions, the things that we have to work against sometimes to, to, to get those aspirations put into place. Um, in every case, we're looking at functionality, but we're also looking at uh, aesthetics, we're looking at cost, uh, we're looking at durability, we're looking at environmental impact. And we're always designing these things, of course, uh, in these contexts of uh, building codes, our clients' uh, budget or costs, uh, what the local construction industry is capable of, uh, the performance of the material, uh, how it behaves, and, and what its limitations are. And then, of course, more and more, we're looking at the, the energy costs, both in terms of embodied uh, and life cycle energy. Concrete, steel, timber, masonry, all of these uh, have advantages and disadvantages as we're looking at what we want to do versus the, the restrictions that are, that are put on us. Um, concrete is one of our oldest materials. Uh, of course, the, the, the biggest free-spanning dome for centuries in the world was the Pantheon, which is an, a fairly early example of Roman concrete. Um, despite having kind of lost the technology for a, a millennium or so, uh, it re-emerged in the 19th century, and today we build our tallest buildings out of it as well. So here the Kingdom Tower currently under construction in Jeddah which is uh, projected to be about a kilometer tall. And you can see that uh, we're going back and using a technique that was developed really about 2,000 years ago uh, in Rome, using at that time a volcanic ash that had what we call a cementitious quality. Uh, when uh, water is added to it, uh, it reconstitutes uh, in monolithic form the minerals, uh, which it's made out of in a, in a sort of powdered form. We use the same basic principle today uh, when we're making cement, one of the ingredients in concrete, uh, although of course our understanding of the chemistry and therefore our ability to make much, much stronger uh, concrete um, supersedes, of course, that of, of centuries past. We also have the advantage that we use concrete typically uh, in a hybrid situation. So we use it in conjunction with steel to make structural elements, structural systems, uh, that are good not only in compression, which is concrete's kind of natural performance uh, ability, but also in tension. Uh, we partner it with steel. Steel takes the tension and we're able to get good, uh, good materials uh, in bending, or good uh, elements in bending. Um, concrete has several advantages, lots of good reasons to use it. Uh, first of all, it is uh, almost entirely fireproof. It's very difficult to damage a concrete building uh, if it's properly designed with fire. Uh, and it's durable. The Pantheon is still there. It has lasted centuries. If you treat the concrete right, if you maintain it, if you keep it kind of out of the rain, uh, concrete literally being a, a mineral, like being a, a great big stone, uh, can last for a, a long, long time. It is free form. Uh, we uh, cast concrete, so any shape that we can build uh, out of a formwork material, whether that's timber or today fiberglass or maybe plastic, uh, we can make that form and we can make that shape in, uh, in, in concrete. We can tune the shape to make really structurally efficient forms. Uh, this is something that we're a bit more limited uh, in, in what we can do with steel or timber. Concrete, we can basically tune the form uh, to achieve structural advantages both uh, along a longitudinal axis of a structural member but also in its cross-section axis.
We can uh, get it in multiple textures, finishes, and colors. We can either add stuff to the concrete while it's being mixed, or we can give it surface treatments that uh, can, can give us a, a really wide palette uh, of aesthetic choices. It has high thermal mass, so it is good uh, in terms of uh, uh, kind of easing the, the uh, daily cycle of thermal highs and lows. And along with that, it's high mass means that it's also sound and vibration proof or, or resistant. Uh, it's very good for acoustic separation and it's particularly good when we're trying to install mechanical equipment that might shake or vibrate a uh, building. Concrete resists that as well as anything else. And it also has relatively low material costs. This doesn't mean that it's necessary, uh, necessarily always the cheapest solution to a structural problem. As we'll see, uh, there are other things that come into play, in particular labor costs and formwork costs, but the material itself is relatively cheap. Uh, and part of the advantage to concrete is that it can also be predominantly locally uh, obtained. We have a few specialist uh, materials that go into concrete, cement being the, the primary one, uh, but a lot of the volume of concrete is what's called aggregate, sand and gravel, uh, and that is almost always obtainable locally. Uh, so we may have to import uh, the cement from someplace, uh, but that's a relatively small percentage of the overall mix, and a lot of what uh, we actually put into a concrete building can come from uh, within whatever region uh, we're building in. Concrete can be used for everything in a structure. So we've seen it most so far in slabs and foundations, uh, but it can also be used for walls, columns, beams, uh, almost anything that, that, that carries load. If we can uh, design it with some steel in it, uh, we can put uh, concrete just about anywhere. It has a naturally high compressive strength, particularly today when we engineer uh, high strength concrete. And again, if we pair it or hybridize it with steel, uh, we can match that compressive strength with tensile strength and thus make concrete good uh, in bending as well as in compression. Depending on how we cast it, uh, we can get what we call monolithic structural behavior. So because we're essentially making one giant piece of concrete when we do a building structure, uh, that structure has inherent rigidity, inherent stiffness. We can make connections, particularly out of port in place concrete, uh, that, that take up all of the gravity and lateral forces uh, that, that we're concerned with in building structures. And then generally, because we can form it into cross sections that are very structurally efficient, we can often use less material and, in particular, less depth uh, than, in some other, uh, than in some other materials. So we tend to have shallower floor depths, though, as we'll see again, there are some trade-offs uh, with, with using concrete in, in floor systems that have to do with integrating mechanical, uh, mechanical ductwork and things like that. Uh, again, we look at, we use concrete really in two ways. We either bring it to the site in liquid form and we pour it into molds that are sitting in place, or the Latin in situ is a, a phrase you'll hear quite a bit. Um, this has some distinct advantages uh, in that um, we're basically buying a material and, and bringing it right to the site. There's no fabrication that has to happen uh, off-site. On the other hand, we have uh, supply chain issues. We've got to get to the concrete, uh, or we've got to get the concrete to the job site uh, sort of just in time. And when we take that form off, we're pretty much stuck with what's there. Uh, on the other hand, precast concrete, where we're actually pouring concrete in factory conditions off site and bringing the resulting pieces uh, uh, to, the, to the construction site on the back of a truck, um, gives us certain advantages in terms of quality control, in terms of uh, supply chain, and also often in terms of uh, cost. You know, we're not in particular building complicated formwork uh, on an exposed job site in what may be uh, kind of adverse conditions. There are advantages and disadvantages to both of these. Either one of them, uh, we can incorporate steel in a couple of ways. We can use conventional reinforcement, uh, or we can use pre-stressing or post-tensioning, and these are two things that we'll talk about uh, as, as we get more into this as ways, again, to take advantage of the, the tensile strength of steel and to match it with concrete's natural uh, compressive strength. Uh, concrete's fire resistance is kind of uh, unparalleled, and when we look in particular at um, uh, tall buildings or large buildings that have to be type 1 or type 2, so very, very fire resistant, two, three-hour um, 
uh, uh, resistance ratings. Um, these are naturally achievable with concrete. And you can see uh, on the bottom here that a reinforced concrete column will naturally get up to a four hour rating. Um, if we're using steel uh, or especially timber, it can be difficult for the material alone to get up to that kind of uh, hourly rating. And we'll very often see, especially with steel, that we'll match that with concrete. We'll actually pour concrete around the steel uh, or put a sort of lightweight aggregate free concrete around the steel uh, to make it fireproof. So there's almost like, you can think of this almost as a continuum, right? Where we're trying to get the compressive strength and the fire resistance of concrete. We're trying to get the bending or tensile strength of steel. And we have this kind of range of solutions where either we're making steel columns that we're kind of wrapping in fireproof uh, concrete, or we're making concrete columns that are naturally fireproof that we're uh, embedding, reinforcing steel uh, into. Either way, we get this kind of multi-variable uh, uh, performance, right? We get high uh, compression uh, ability, high tensile ability, and high fire resistance. When we look at uh, why we might not use concrete, we have a couple of areas where site cast concrete in particular uh, gives us problems that we have to deal with or where there are other materials that, that maybe do a better job. Um, some of the biggest ones are, first of all, uh, we can't pour concrete very easily under adverse weather conditions. Uh, cold is probably the, the best known, that if it gets too cold, obviously, uh, it, Water is a big component of concrete, and we either need to add chemicals to the mix to allow that water to pour if it gets below freezing, uh, or we need to simply not uh, pour concrete when we think uh, it's, it's going to be too cold out. This, of course, has a huge impact on schedule, um, but there are other uh, weather conditions that make concrete difficult. Concrete is a material whose finish is very sensitive to humidity and temperature changes. So if we have a tall building, we have exposed concrete on a number of different floors, we pour the lower floors uh, in the summer, the upper floors in the fall or winter, we're gonna find that the concrete looks different depending on what the conditions were when it cured. Uh, and we may have to monitor temperature and humidity. We may have to adjust the recipe for concrete as the, as the uh, job, job goes forward uh, to control some of these, some of these factors. It's true, too, that um, concrete, uh, one of the trade-offs for the, its low material cost is a relatively long uh, construction time. Um, we not only have to basically build the building two or three times, uh, we have to build uh, reinforcement uh, cages, we have to build formwork, and then we have to actually pour the concrete. We also have to wait for that concrete to cure and to come up to a, a reliable strength uh, before we remove any of the supports that are holding that formwork up. So in a multi-story building, even if we're using quick concrete, it may not be possible to do more than uh, one floor a week or so, just because we're waiting for that concrete uh, to, to come up to strength. And then finally, concrete is uh, heavy. It's a very, very uh, dense material. Uh, and so it puts a, a much larger dead load on foundations than lighter materials uh, like steel. If we have uh, foundation problems, the monolithic nature of concrete will often work against us. Um, if there's uneven settlement, uh, it doesn't have the flexibility or the ductility uh, to handle uh, that kind of movement. We may see cracks uh, and things. And then it's also, uh, it's complicated. We have to get uh, both carpenters, uh, iron workers to put the rebar in, uh, and then concrete uh, workers and laborers to finish the material. So the contractor has to coordinate those trades to make sure that they can all work uh, in ways that, that allow the schedule to go forward. And then finally, even though we have the capability of making all of these uh, forms with it, um, the, the more complex the forms, of course, the more expensive, the longer the, the process is going to take. And so we very often find that whereas with steel, we can use things like open web joists to integrate mechanical, electrical lighting uh, systems. In concrete, what we find is that very often to keep the formwork simple, we can't actually get the sort of openings or the, or the porosity in floor systems, especially that we sometimes rely on to integrate mechanical systems into the, into the structure. As you can see, some of these uh, problems can be mitigated by switching from site cast to precast. We'll talk about 
uh, what some of those are. But it's important to know that there are trade-offs with the material in general, right? In particular, weight, uh, often uh, time, uh, and its sensitivity to, to temperature and humidity. When we look at um, types uh, and spans, uh, here are uh, some spanning charts that show various uh, types of um, structural elements. Uh, on the left, section active, so beams, girders, uh, trusses. On the right, uh, surface active systems. And you can see that, um, first of all, we have a, a range of possible spans that we can get depending on uh, whether we're working in simple beams or girders, whether we're working in two-way systems, or one-way systems, uh, and whether we're taking advantage of concrete's ability to spread uh, loads and forces out over its surface, or whether we're simply relying on them to work like uh, timber or steel beams uh, as section active systems. Um, concrete's dead load becomes a problem because, of course, any spanning structure has to carry its own dead weight along with uh, whatever loads are being put onto it. So we're starting in some cases from a disadvantage, right? Concrete has to carry its self weight, which is almost always going to be much greater than steel or timber. And we'll look in detail at some of these comparisons, but just note for the moment that when we're talking about section active systems, we're generally talking about uh, concrete spans from uh, about five to maybe uh, 25 or 30 meters, right? So relatively middle of the range uh, spans. If we switch to surface active structures, uh, you can see that those uh, get much greater and we can get spans that are up to maybe 100 or 150 meters. These of course aren't typically multi-story uh, systems at, the, at the, the broader end, but you can see that there are a couple of options where we're using concrete plates um, where we could actually have multi-story very deep uh, floor systems, but multi-story systems that do span uh, a bit further, 20 or, or 30 meters. And we see this often in things like uh, parking garages, things like that. Concrete is uh, made, or, or cement rather, is made by a process of basically taking uh, limestone, uh, calcium carbonate, um, processing it into a powder uh, and, and crushing it, uh, heating it, uh, basically baking it uh, so that it becomes a, a, this kind of pure chemical that when we add water back into it, uh, chemical reactions take place that in some ways kind of turn it back into monolithic limestone. So you can think about uh, the cement process as taking a naturally occurring mineral, uh, crushing it, baking it, uh, turning it into this powder that we can then uh, add water to and watch it kind of recure, right? Become a become basically a stone again. Um, this is one key ingredient, right? This is what we call the cementitious uh, part of the of the concrete mix. We always talk about cement as being the actual uh, calcium carbonate uh, mineral. We talk about concrete as being the whole recipe. So cement plus all of this other stuff. Cement itself uh, it requires, of course, a, a, a fair amount of, uh, of limestone. So these uh, industries are usually located where the natural resources are, so wherever there is a good outcropping of limestone. You can think about concrete basically as, as kind of almost like a baking process, right? It's a, baking a concrete structure is analogous to uh, making a tin of muffins. Um, we have a very, very sensitive recipe where we have to be very careful about the chemistry that goes into it. So the proportions of cement to water, uh, the proportions of cement to other aggregates, right? The, the, the cement is kind of analogous to flour in a baking recipe. The aggregate is uh, analogous to the stuff we might put in it, right? Raisins or chocolate chips or something like that. You can think about it too, that, that we're, we're taking a, a kind of liquid, right, a, a batter in the case of baking, and we're putting it into a mold. And the way that that mold is shaped and the way that we treat that mold is also going to have an impact on the, the quality of whatever comes out of it. So in, in the case of the muffin tin, if we don't like kind of accurate or adequately uh, prepare the muffin pan by like buttering it or putting in paper liners, the muffins are going to stick, right? And when we try to pull them out, uh, the muffins are going to come out in pieces. Similar things happen with concrete. Uh, we have to be very, very precise about the recipe that we're putting into it, right? The right amount of, of uh, various amounts of stuff. 
we also have to be very careful about the way we handle it on site, um, both you know how long we cook it, how long we cure it, but also what the, the formwork or the muffin tin uh, does to the actual finished product, right? And, and whether we're able to get the concrete out of the, the baking tray, if you like. The mixtures that we put, the thing, stuff that we put in with the, the cement itself, uh, is usually uh, most of it is what we call aggregate. And we'll have two types usually, a coarse aggregate or gravel and a fine aggregate or sand. And the proportions of these, again, affect the concrete's appearance, but they also affect, can affect the concrete's uh, strength. We may use local stone for aggregate uh, because we're interested in sort of matching color. Uh, that can come from the gravel or it can come from the sand. We may find that there are surface treatments where we want to show more of the aggregate or less. So we may try to take off uh, a, a very, very thin layer of uh, the concrete so that we see more of the, of the gravel inside. And then finally, the, the amount of water, the amount of sand, the amount of cement, all of this combines to create uh, a mix that is either stronger or weaker. And there are a series of tests that will happen while the concrete is being poured, uh, often called slump tests. And you see this uh, in the lower right, where an engineer will uh, look at the concrete as it comes out of the truck. They will measure literally the amount that the, the wet mixture slumps when they uh, take it out of a mold. And based on that, there are things that they can know about uh, the proportion of water to the proportion of sand, the proportion of cement. And this will give them some idea of whether that concrete is likely to come up to the specified strength uh, or not once it, once it cures. We can put other stuff into the, the mix besides aggregate water and cement that will uh, affect a number of different variables uh, in, the, in the concrete. Um, we can add stuff to it that will make it set uh, quicker or slower. So if we're really, really worried about the speed of construction, we can add stuff that will uh, allow it to cure faster. Um, we might also want it to cure uh, over time longer. Uh, sometimes this gives us a, a, a better finish or a finish that, that, that we like better architecturally. If we have complicated formwork, and we're concerned about getting concrete into all the kind of uh, nooks and crannies of, of a complicated piece of formwork, we might add stuff that makes the concrete flow better as a liquid. So um, plasticizers and things like that that allow the concrete to reach the kind of uh, far areas of, of a complicated piece of formwork. And maybe most commonly, we will put uh, admixtures in that increase the strength of concrete. So going from two or 3,000 PSI concrete up to seven or 8,000 PSI concrete maybe. Uh, and from our point of view as architects, we're very often uh, concerned uh, with uh, the, the finish of the concrete or the color. And we can put in admixtures like almost like dyes that will change the color of the concrete uh, or that affect uh, what we can do to the surface uh, once, it's, once it's done. Um, we get these uh, from all sorts of uh, sources. Fly ash is a, is a very popular um, place to get, uh, to get admixtures, um, but they also come from a number of waste products. So even though these are chemicals that we're adding to the mix, often we're getting them from sources that uh, are, are polluting anyway. Right? We're actually taking pollutants out of uh, the, the airstream or the water stream and embedding them into, uh, into the concrete that we're using. And as you can see, um, we have these kind of uh, class of, uh, classes of, uh, of, of admixtures that uh, can entrain air or reduce water. So uh, these both affect the, the workability of the concrete, uh, how easy it is to move around, and eventually also the strength. Usually these two are working uh, against one another. We can increase the uh, speed at which the concrete comes up to strength or the uh, amount of time that it takes to set. And then we can also, again, use plasticizers. Some of these allow us to use less water, make for good workability, a tighter, denser concrete, but also one that's more likely to fill the, the, the forms that we're using. Once it's come up to strength, uh, we have a number of ways that we can treat the concrete to make it span a relatively far distance. Um, we looked at some of these when we were talking about structural elements and slabs in particular. 
But just as a reminder, uh, we can treat concrete as what we call a one-way system. So it's basically like a, a really, really wide beam. But we can take advantage of its monolithic nature also to make it a two-way system. So that floor slabs in particular are spanning in two directions. And this uh, increases the, uh, the static performance uh, of a slab uh, exponentially, right? It gets, it gets much more efficient uh, when we're spanning in multiple directions. And when we get to what we call a, a, a bonded a two-way slab, um, you can see that we're really working almost as a, almost as a surface uh, structure, uh, more so than a sectional structure. These are things that we can only do uh, with concrete's monolithic nature. When we make one-way uh, slabs or one-way systems, we're basically looking at turning concrete uh, into a pretty good approximation of a, of a, a, a slab, joist, and girder system. So it looks very similar if you kind of squint at it uh, to a, a timber joist system. A two-way system very often um, will either design a, a flat slab, so a relatively thick, relatively heavy, a uh, slab that spans a, a more or less uh, square bay, or we have ways of coming in and kind of scooping out a lot of the dead load, right? Turning that uh, thick flat slab into what we call a waffle slab, right? That you, that you see here. And you can think of both of these systems really as either adding monolithic elements to one another. So taking a, a floor slab, adding joists, adding girders, all of which are linked because of uh, concrete's monolithic nature. Or you can kind of look at it the other way and think of both of these as really, really thick floor slabs where we're coming in and strategically taking out as much dead weight as we can, right? Leaving behind a kind of network uh, of, of uh, structural elements, again, all monolithically connected uh, that, can, that can work together. Two ways, basically, of coffering a slab, right? Taking out uh, some of the some of the dead weight. So we talked a little bit about uh, where concrete's good and where it's not. Some of the bigger issues that, that we deal with, and when we design, we're trying always to kind of uh, eliminate. Um, we have a, a problem with dead weight that as we increase uh, a span, right? The 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 size of a span might go up linearly, but because we're making a volume of concrete the volume is going up exponentially, right? Cubed instead of squared. Because concrete is so heavy, it's particularly sensitive to this problem. And dead weight in concrete usually ends up being the thing that limits the spans uh, that, that, that we can cope with. Um, concrete is both uh, an imprecise material and a labor intensive one. So a, a concrete job site is a mess. And all of the kind of formwork, all the kind of uh, very, very uh, quick pouring that has to happen, and the amount of labor on the job site means that it is what we call a wet system. And wet systems are always vulnerable to imprecision, uh, to delays in schedule, to errors that once they're made often are very, very difficult to correct. So we have to kind of um, treat concrete as an imprecise material, design around uh, a lot of the imprecision, a lot of the inaccuracy that's inherent uh, in, in concrete uh, construction. And then finally, it has an environmental toll, not as great as some other materials, but nevertheless something that we need to be conscious of. In all of these cases, uh, it is going to help matters if we find ways to design with less material, to minimize the amount of actual concrete uh, that we're putting into the building, to, to find ways uh, to, to to sort of supercharge the systems we're using uh, to minimize, again, both the volume but also the, the kind of environmental impact uh, of the material that we're using. You can really see the limitations of concrete uh, when you compare it in, in various systems. So here again, we're taking that, that page of uh, section active structures. And if you look closely, you can see that we actually compare, this chart actually compares um, three different materials, wood, steel and concrete for these three systems. So a, a, a Virendil truss uh, or a, 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 a plate girder uh, on the upper left, uh, two-way systems on the, uh, on the next two. And you can see that for the same system, the same shapes, uh, concrete actually can span much less than wood or steel. In section active structures, concrete is almost always going to be less efficient than steel or timber for the same girder, for the same beam. 
And the reason for this is that it is so heavy. It is such a dense material that it struggles basically to carry its own self weight uh, over these spans. This is mitigated, of course, by the fact that it's monolithic, that we can use it for columns and, and girders and slabs. Um, but it's important to note that uh, when we use concrete, we're already kind of behind the eight ball because the material is so heavy and has to carry its own weight uh, over these spans. And finally, here's a concrete's ecological profile, and you can see that it does uh, much better than uh, steel and brick uh, along these axes that we worry about, um, how much water it uses, how much energy it uses, uh, whether it contributes to deforestation and, and how much it costs. Um, you can see, though, that uh, it, it does have a, a fairly high cost in terms of the amount of dust that we're putting into the atmosphere. And compared with timber, uh, it has a much higher profile in a number of uh, areas. So uh, energy, uh, and energy in particular, um, it takes a lot more fuel to make a certain amount of concrete, in part because we have to actually burn the, the or calcine uh, the limestone, burning the limestone to get the, the cementitious material. This is mitigated somewhat by the fact that uh, concrete, the, the percentage of the, of the volume of concrete uh, that is local is often very high. If we can use local aggregates, uh, local sand, local water, um, we're not having to transport the entire volume uh, of the building uh, very far distances. We might have to do that in particular uh, with steel. Okay, uh, we will leave it there. Uh, and in the second kind of little bite of our concrete lecture, um, we will look at uh, specifically how we uh, get site cast concrete uh, poured, uh, what we have to do in terms of forming it, uh, things we have to look out for when it's on the site, and some rules of thumb about uh, how big stuff has to be, our structural sizes uh, for concrete that's actually poured on site, poured in place.